one. Welcome once again to Raging Chickens Out the Coop Podcast. Yes, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. You know, here on Out the Coop Live, August 17th, 2020, this is a space where we get to talk to progressives, to activists, and troublemakers of all sort from right in our own backyards and across the country. So Out the Coop Live joins our weekly Friday show in which Sean Kitchen and I break down the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. And you can get both by subscribing to our podcast on Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. But you can only join the live conversation through the Podbean app on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern. We're also streaming this on our YouTube channel, too. So if you want to head over there, got to watch it there. You get to see my ugly mug um, and then uh, the rest of the audio stuff there. You can support this show by becoming a patron for as little as five bucks a month by going to patreon.com slash RC Press. Or you can show us some love during our live show by sending us a little gift through the Podbean app. You see, they got this little thing at the bottom of the app, right? It's a little gift icon, right? You click on that, right? And you can send us a virtual cup of coffee or a love balloon, some roses, even a gold mic. You know, knock yourself out, right? Just get yourself some golden beans. That's what they actually call them, golden beans. Like we're in some some, some freaking fantasy land here in the podcast, but whatever. Um, Get some golden beans. You can send the love. The gifts that you send us help support and expand this podcast. And I'll tell you what, tonight's show's got you all fired up. You know, take a quick break and then tune into the Rick Smith Show's live stream at 9 p.m. tonight on his YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook, wherever he's streaming. And a special shout out, as always, to Jonathan Mann, who wrote our intro song, There Are No People in the Future. Check out all his great stuff on his YouTube page and follow him on Twitter at Song of Day Man. Uh, that's Song of Day Man with two N's. Jonathan Mann, two N's. Uh, Jonathan holds that, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records of writing the most songs consecutively in days consecutively. I don't even know how you say that, but that's the idea. So on tonight's show, I am absolutely freaking thrilled. um, And I'm joined by two organizers from the Racial Justice Organizing Committee in Philadelphia, Tamara Anderson and Dana Carter. Tamara Anderson is an advocate for children and teens, professional artist, singer, director, editor, freelance writer, blogger for over 20 years experience and educator. And now I'm tired of talking. (laughs) But click on the link in the show notes for her long list of credits. And yes, I did see you on Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) And she's also one of the founding members of the Black uh, National Black Lives Matter um, Week of Action at schools. And Dana Carter is a racial and social justice advocate for urban learners at the PA Level 2 Elementary Education K-6 through Certified Teacher. In addition to organizing the Racial Justice Organizing Committee, Dana is an educational policy advisor with the Melanated Educators Collective. She's been involved with the Philly Education as a K-12 through teacher and an adjunct faculty member as well as an educational activist since the turn of the 20th century. 21st century. I'd love to be able to say that. Right? So it's like, you know, it's like we're in some sort of kind of like sci fi space universe here. It's just the turn of the century. God, I used to, I remember growing up thinking, thinking back, you know, you talk about the turn of the century, 20th century is like so long ago, but here we are, here at the beginning of the 21st. And I got to say, you know, um, it's, uh, uh, I, I remember, um, and I talked a little bit um, um, to tomorrow about this uh, ahead, of, ahead of tonight's show um, as we we're just talking, getting ready for it, that I remember actually kind of coming across her work with, uh, uh, Shira Cohen back in Labor Notes back in 2017 with this great piece and you'll, this will be linked in the show notes too about how Black Lives Matter came to Philadelphia schools so that's really good um, so welcome tomorrow welcome Dana to the show 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. So I, I think just as kind of like to set the tone for those folks who may, may not be kind of familiar with all the work that's um, the Racial Justice Organizing Committee is doing, I thought it might be good to just kind of start us off with a little bit of like looking at just I'll kind of read out just what the mission statement is, and then maybe kind of turn to you tomorrow to give us a little bit of some of the background of kind of how this kind of Racial Justice Organizing Committee came um, came to be um, and it's and it's and it's kind of genesis, so to speak, and where bring us up to where we are now. So the mission of the Racial Justice Organizing Committee um, exists as a space for educators and allies to engage in collective learning and action for racial justice to make our schools as and as a result, the city places that allow black and brown students, educators and families to thrive. Right. And hope and throughout tonight, we're going to get into uh, some of the 10 demands they've got before a radical educational transformation, which are just are freaking awesome. So um, tomorrow, why don't I turn to you first? You maybe talk a little bit about um, what the Racial Justice Organizing Committee is all about, a little bit of some of its history and how it came to be. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, it started in 2015. Um, it was it was the first committee that the Caucus of Working Educators had started under its umbrella because the caucus itself had started, um, just really started in 2014 itself, right? So then what happened is during, under this umbrella, and this really came out of, we were having book talks. We had just had like our, we were, which now everybody does, you know, joins us every summer. And it's like a big thing, but in its first iteration, the book talks that the caucus of working educators, the working educators hosted, um, was basically is and still is at that time was really like a hub to really talk about labor and progressive labor, rank and file movements, and how do we, how do union members get more involved? You know, because for a lot of us, especially if if your union experience started here in Philly, maybe in the last. 10, 15 years, it hasn't been like this very activated type of thing, right? It's been kind of a kind of a dormant um, action where you're like, who do I call when I have problems? And <laughs> like, <laughs> right, what right. I, like what's, what's coming out of my check every two weeks? You know what I'm saying? So, yep. um, and so because of that, we really wanted to engage people in a real way about not only how do you get involved in rank and file movements, but how does that intersect with black movements, with black bodies, um, with queer lives, like where does that look like, right? How does it, mm -hmm. what does it look like when you connect that to housing issues and economic issues and things that are happening in the community around the school that are affecting your students and parents and families on a daily basis? So pop up, here comes the racial justice organizing community. And then like literally within its first year, around 2016, fall 2016, Seattle, Washington had this massive um, action, a Black Lives Matter action, um, where over thousands of teachers walked out of school wearing Black Lives Matter shirts to support their students. And a group of uh, members of the Racial Justice Organizing Committee, including myself, um, heard about this action and were like, what should we do here in the city? And so then that then became Black Lives Matter Week of Action. And the first Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter Week of Action was January 2017, hence the article that was written in Labor Note right. about like where did that come from. And so as that continued, then like by 2018, um, the summer of 2017, a group of, of members from the Caucus of Working Educators went to Free People, uh, Free People, Free Minds, Free Minds, Free People, sorry, conference in Baltimore and did a Black Lives Matter week of action presentation. And people were so excited about it that they were like, where do we sign up? Where, where can we join? Right. And then before you knew it, it became a national thing. And so now um, me and one other person serve um, on the National Steering Committee for Black Lives Matter at school. Um, and, and now it has, you know, we got demands after 2019, which included anti-racist training, more counselors, more cops, the hiring more black educators, making African American studies and ethnic studies mandated, right? And now we're embarking on a year of purpose to, to really highlight the principles, not just during the week in February, but now from October throughout the whole year till June. So that's something that's being launched that's actually on the, the Black Lives Matter at Schools.com webpage if you're interested in looking at that. So yeah. 
Awesome. And I think that, you know, it's, um, it's so good to see the kind of work you're pushing forward now, because obviously so much is dominated right now by, say, COVID-19 and back to school and the pandemic and all this. And then you can hear some of the voices even within, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say even within, but within, you know, like liberal communities say, well, we need to address this first. Right. right. And I, I don't know how you you go about addressing anything even remotely connected to the coronavirus stuff without starting with racial justice. I mean, I, I don't it, there is no right, especially Especially when we have politicized COVID, right? Exactly. So we have politicized and racialized COVID, which basically means that even a pandemic falls victim to the racialized and politicized lines that the United States has had forever, right? It's like it's like it's like evidence number one if you were doing a case, right? It's like we can't even talk about the science and biology of it without acknowledging the fact that because we have fluid borders, because, you know, more, 50% of more cases of positive COVID cases are African-American and Latinx individuals, it's like, you cannot talk about the fact of why that is. It's not exactly. because, you know, all the conspiracy theorists that were like, well, black people are more prone. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, it has a lot to do with access to healthcare, pre-existing <laughs> conditions. It has to do with the fact that it's the sim. It's very similar to like if if pneumonia hit the United States, right? In the black community, it'd be death. You know, they'd be like, bye bye, yep. see you later. We checked out, right? And to the majority community that makes up the power structure and the money structure, they would just get a vaccine or have like a have some medicine because they have pneumonia. We're gonna sleep and take care of it. We can rest. You know, da da da. That's not what's happening. So you have to look at like I don't know how you cannot look at everything. That's why I think these protests and the, these, these, I like to say the summer of uprising yeah. have really converged. One, because people are home, right? Two, most people don't have a job to lose. They're like, oh, well, I can go join this work because you fired me already or I'm furloughed or whichever, right? Or the fact that you're shining a bright light on all the brokenness that has been broken for a very, very long time. And you are asking for people not just to pay attention to it, but to like do something about it, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, they talk about this as a way of kind of of highlighting it's it's coronavirus is just basically just like you said, it's it put the light behind like kind of behind the scenes so you can see it all shooting through the cracks and the divisions of the fissures right. that are already there. Right. You mm -hmm. know, I always have that image of like when you see like, you know, like these, you know, sci fi. I'm a big sci fi person. So you're gonna, I'm sorry for the references. But, you know, you see like, you know, planets exploding before they actually yeah. explode. Yeah. You see that yeah. stuff shooting through. Right. You see that yeah. shooting through. Well, let, let me let me let, let me turn to you, Dana. So, I mean, what what like t talk to me a little bit about kind of your way into this? What brought you to this um, to, uh, the Racist Justice Organizing Committee um, and kind of like what's that work look like for you? Sure. Well, I started out as a regular teacher in the school district of Philadelphia in my classroom. But just naturally, I guess, because of my personality, I just became an advocate. And that's when I was teaching in Kensington. Um, I left America and I went to Abu Dhabi and I kind of lived in a lap of luxury for two years <laughs> and I taught overseas. But I, I really missed the dedication and, and just the connection I had with the students in Philadelphia. So I left and I came back home and I said to everybody when I came back to the school district of Philadelphia, like I left paradise to come back here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to let that trip be in vain. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I transform the school district of Philadelphia since I came back. So, um, when I came back, I came back with a different set of eyes and I was a bit more analytical about the positions that I had with the school district. And I b began to pay attention to the systems that were in place that were prohibiting our children from achieving success. Um, I identified those systems, uh, talked with school district administrators, and then I saw a group of teachers who seemed to be advocating just as loudly as, as I was. Mm -hmm. And that's initially when I connected um, with the caucus of working educators. And then after I connected with the caucus, it just, of course, naturally drew me to the work of the Racial Justice Organizing Committee and Melanated Educators Collective. So um, in, with the Racial Justice Organizing Committee, I feel like I don't have to uh, sugarcoat my advocacy and activism. Um, I feel like it's a great place for people like me to be to, to have a voice mm -hmm. and have support. 
and figure out ways how you can eliminate the school to prison pipeline with people with like minds. Um, my work in the uh, racial and, and social justice committee mainly comes with uh, policy. Mm -hmm. I am constantly speaking at the school board meetings about changing a policy or amending a policy or reviewing a policy because um, just because I've been teaching for a long time, you, you realize that a number of policies don't exist, which is why um, certain systems aren't in place or you know the, the, the systems are failing. Um, and so with that um, analytical eye, uh, I try to help other people, other um, organizations just kind of address their racial and social justice concerns. Well, you know, so so you're like that person that shows up to school board and they're all like, oh, shit, here she is again. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Here comes right? trouble. Right. Yes. Right. I call myself the troublemaker educator because they know they know what it is when I'm coming. Right. But you know, over time, right. they understand that the things that I'm saying are valid, and they're a bit more responsive to my to my asks these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, both of you brought up this stuff about, and I just, you know, this is one of the things that if people have been listening to our our regular Friday podcast, you've heard Sean and I talk about this over, like over the years, and we've been writing about this as long as. Ray Raging Chicken has existed since back in kind of 2011. Um, oh. But, you know, is is that, you know, this is the kind of like, you know, one of the uh, pull, pulling the Band-Aid off certain aspects of kind of what it means to be um, kind of part of the militant minority in labor. Right. Oh. Is that, uh -huh. you know, is the idea is that. Um, you know, you all know you got experience with labor, you got experience with unions. You know that once you're, if you're like a representative or you're an officer, right, you have to you kind of stay within particular kinds of bounds, right? Correct. Um, yeah, and mm -hmm. which always limits, the, say, the radical potential or even the progressive. I mean, let's like we don't even have to jump all the way to radical. We could talk about just even just like progressiveness, right, of right. of a union movement. It limits that. So the whole idea mm. about establishing caucuses is so essential mm -hmm. because then you are not speaking for the union or from the union. You are a Correct. member and you're making demands upon your union at the same Correct. time that you're part of it. And I think mm -hmm. that the only time that we've ever seen like progress within labor is when we've had that kind of sense of a strong commitment to both labor, right? And justice, whether it's racial justice, whether it's gender justice, whether it's, you know, like sexual orientation, it's always been that, that bull and push. And I think that's, Absolutely. um, you know, and sometimes I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know was familiar with the caucus of working educators and some of the struggles that mm -hmm. they had with, you know, with the existing leadership of the AFT in Philly, the PFT. Um, mm -hmm. but it's also, sometimes you get that, that dual quality of both. You're kind of like you're, you're fighting a system and you're fighting your own leadership at times. Right. So, right. Yeah. Um, so to have that space where you're actually saying, you know, this is what I love even about the way that you kind of both conceptualize, you know, the, the, the way that the mission of um, um, uh, the Racial Justice Organizing Committee is and the kind of 10 demands of the committee is really kind of doing that both and thing. There's no question about the commitment to like, you know, on the job stuff, but it's like, no, guess what? We could do better. It's not just a service unionism. We're going to get the community together. We're going to get people together. Anybody who wants to be part of dramatic social uh, social movements and change, we're going to welcome into the fold. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I think I think that um, what you just highlighted uh, and what you just said is so important about, you know, the teachers union and and possibly like the nurses union, like we are not producing products. You know what I mean? Like this is right. not this is not a warehouse type of union or we're not producing cars. And if we mess up, it's not like a door jam. If we mess up, the child <laughs> right. doesn't get educated. Right. right? Exactly. So because of yeah, be, so because of that, we need to expect more out out of our unions in supporting our, our quote unquote products which are the children and their families um and the and i understand the limits of 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 union leaders because they have to be loyal to their base right and if you look at the school district of philadelphia the base of teachers is 70 percent caucasian so when you go and you scream to our to our pft or the leader of the pft you know we want this and we want that you have to understand how his base would respond to those types of requests so you need those outside agitators to try to you know spark these types of movements and have marches mm -hmm. in city hall just to to explain to the community how important it is and then in turn the community perhaps can 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 put some pressure or influence those officials to make these changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
all that because you have to have that. Because if, <laughs> right. if not, well, if not, I think too, I like to say that we also, I really need for also all of us to stop pretending that public education is in its exception was created as some sort of vehicle for liberation and freedom. Right. There, there we it go. It wasn't. So you're not only fighting against the norms of that, but you are literally trying to turn it on its head every time, right? You're trying to challenge it because like, until we can uh, completely eradicate or like Ava DuVernay likes to say the best, like I remember an interview about 13, somebody asked, are you looking for reforms for prisoners or the, or, or the prison system? She said, no, I'm looking for it to be blown up. Yeah, That's right. Exactly. I'm looking for it to be like dismantled because we know that reforms, you're just putting a band-aid over stuff so that you can still stay in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. We're trying to push things so far off the left that it's completely off the map altogether, right? So we are actually building something in some sort of something that we want to see together. But until that happens, right, while you are waiting for that major change to take place, you still have to figure out what type of strategies can be can agitate the system today especially mm-hmm. when you have students who are you know black at central black at maximum we have students screaming their very uh-huh. lives about mm-hmm. racism and harassment Absolutely. by mm-hmm. you know educators in school and the fact is, is that when you go back and look at policy 249, which is the sexual harassment and racial harassment policy for the school district, uh, they still have the SRC as the governing body of the policy. Mm-hmm. That is the actual policy that's supposed to protect children today on the school district website. They also have two and a half pages of examples of racialized incidents and the date, the original date on that policy it's 2013. Yep. Mm-hmm. When, and you know, it's, so this is nothing new. Not that any of us are surprised. It's just the fact that now the students, the students are standing up and yes, saying no more. They're saying, okay. look, we want to be protected. We want to be safe. Even in our virtual environments, we want to be able to choose the name we want to go by without mm-hmm. a bunch of pushback and a bunch of like misunderstanding, right? Yep. And the question is like, how do you, what it, what can you do to make that happen? Which leads us like directly into like why these 10 demands were so important to create a right and push. Well, mm-hmm. and, and I see that I see those 10 demands and like, let's, and this is a good, this is a good time to kind of look at, it. I'll give you a little c- couple stories to kind of uh, as kind of background there too, as well as like, I remember like feel like the Philly student union when their walkouts, Right. And mm-hmm. you had student walkouts in Philadelphia. Right. And those students, you could see what happened over kind of, you know, several days and then months and then eventually years. Right. Of of getting that sense of that experience in kind of like going out. And at that time, having having the fortune of having teachers and community members and activists there to yeah. help them. Right. Uh-huh. Because I'll give you, you know, this is a, there was a, a, a similar issue that was going. I mean, it was the same kind of time you had the rise of kind of like Black Lives Matter. And then you had kind of demands for racial justice up in the Lehigh Valley. Right. Uh-huh. And and, the Le- and they took a lot of some of their cues from what was going on in the Philly Student Union. I remember getting in touch with some of the folks in the teachers union up there and saying, hey, look. Um, I've, I've, people have gotten in touch with me. Some students have gotten in touch with me that they're, um, they, they're looking to organize and stuff. I'm curious, how can I help from the union angle, right? To kind of help get the word out. And they wouldn't talk to me. (laughs) They were very skeptical about it, right? Because they were still, they were, they did not have that kind of infrastructure that had begun to take root in Philly. Right. For this kind of like you've got a kind of more progressive or radical caucus, you've got kind of anti-racist organizing. Right. And of course, Philly's got a long, long history of that, too. So it didn't come out of the blue. But I remember back, I mean, I, I I didn't know Philly very well, like of East Coast towns. I mean, I grew up in kind of central New York, Utica, New York. Uh-huh. Right. I mean, it's, I, I what I remember about Philly is I, I remember the great garbage strike. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, I remember. Tomorrow and I were just talking about that. Yeah. 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 It's like I remember driving through Philly. I don't know where yeah. my parents were taking me somewhere. Right. And they're driving through Philly and be like, oh, my God. Right? It's like, it's like, I'd, like, I'd seen rats in New York like you wouldn't believe, but I'd never seen piles of garbage 
words like that before in my life. And it's like, yeah. so I knew that, right? And then I knew, and I knew um, through ska music, right? Philly had a, an amazing oh, ska yeah. scene. And that's mm-hmm. like the kind of like the racism of Philly, right? That will be encountered in Philly, the long history of both the kind of the, the kind of anti-racist fight back and the kind of like, you know, the attempts to kind of hold on to kind of white supremacy in the city. That's been going on for damn, I mean, as long as I've been mm-hmm. alive. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the third thing was, is that, you know, um, Philly was also one of the original laboratories, right, for the whole charterization and privatization of the schools. And so, you know, I look at, you know, and I'm looking at these 10 demands, right? And I'm looking at these 10 Mm -hmm. demands, which I'll I'll turn it over to you guys to kind of kind of unpack a little bit about what what these are about. And I'm seeing like all of these things coming together right you're talking about infrastructure and resources and unionization and power you're talking about direct kind of anti-racist fight back and you're talking about a pushback against against a kind of privatization and a kind of like profitization of our schools and our children right mm-hmm. um all in mm-hmm. kind of all together and this is happening at the time where of course in in the wake of george floyd again this is not like it wasn't magic that it was like his murder that was like you know oh then some people suddenly woke up i mean this this has been organizing it's going on for a long time that was just the thing right. that brings us to where right. we are now so right. we'll walk us through i mean i mean so these, these kind of 10 demands and what has gone into kind of targeting of that and i hear echoes of kind of black lives matter kind of manifesto in this too as well right i guess we can go back and forth i'll start with one and then maybe you know tomorrow and i yeah, can, yeah, 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 tomorrow yeah. can uh-huh. go to two so um demand number one is uh is the racial justice equity board um Ooh, yeah. we, <laughs> we think that it's uh so important for the school district of philadelphia to be monitored by an outside entity that is consisting of community members teachers parents um and you know it would be my my wish for these to be paid positions like these are full-time paid positions Mm -hmm. um uh we're actually trying to work with uh casa which is the administrators union uh because this is something that they want to see as well uh they call it a diversity equity and inclusion board but it is Uh the same thing that we're requesting which is the oversight committee for the school district of philadelphia we need people to monitor the hiring practices we need to make sure that students are getting into schools um, in a fair way. We need somebody to monitor the budget and the contracts. So um, in order to make sure that everything is running the way that it should in the school district of Philadelphia, we are asking for um, an oversight committee. And I actually went to the school board. I told you that's my whole thing. I went to the school board in January and I um, and I asked them for this. But um, this is something that we're going to push even more with our demand. Mm-hmm. Tamara, would you like to add on to that? Well, yeah, no, I just think that it, you said it all because I, it basically is so interesting because when we, when we were sitting at a ta- had a seat at the MLK Dare table of several years back, mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that was a part of that manifesto, uh, we did that big march from 440 down to the president's house. It was basically the same thing, like oversight committee for police, like having that, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we also have seen these type of committees already be a part of teacher contracts, like in St. Paul, Minneapolis teacher union contract. They have an equity board that basically oversees suspensions and expulsions and any sort of like racial harassment to basically make sure that it's above board, right? we also like uh, the next one is really important, like the implementation and funding of restorative justice and trauma responsive practices in schools. Yes. Um, because we find that, so when you say um, more counselors, no cops, and then of course, you know, the school board has redressed cops into safety officers. Right. They still come from the police department, right? Totally. So it's not. It's almost like dressing up a rat and being like, isn't he pretty? You're like, that. Ah, it's still a rat. It's still a rat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm still disgusted. Right? So, I, I but see I, the tail. Right. You're like, um, no. And, but I do believe that what happens is that when there's like this dissonance among teachers about safety in the school, it has to do with how many times the school board, school district has promised something. Like when we took away kindergarten suspension. Which I think that's a good thing. But the problem is you didn't bring in any more support 
Nope. So like I've had friends who have had fifth graders who have broken glass in windows and that glass end up in their corneas and they're like, okay, like we, you still need more additional support, like to have that. And um, being like a former case manager, you have to have teams that you are able to deploy out, right? You got to make a full commitment to the fact that some, many of our behavior issues in school are directly related to trauma and mm-hmm. mental health care totally. things like that. Um, mm-hmm. And that goes right into the demand for special education programs. So we know we're going to a virtual setting where special ed is, you know, to say they're getting the short end of the stick is not, doesn't even cover it, right? They're getting no part of the stick whatsoever, right? Um, not to mention just last year, you had over a hundred vacancies in special ed. So yep. when people celebrate and say, oh, look, our budget's going to stay the same. I'm like, is that the same budget where there was no special ed teachers and they only had 30 occupational support and PTs? And then yep. people then get that look like, oh, here she comes. I'm like, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> is that what we're happy about? Because that's not a good thing. Like, mm. like that's a problem. Like, when I found out, like, I'm from Chicago originally. Mm-hmm. So I taught in Chicago and New York. That's and- why she has that accent. <laughs> 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 Sounded like she's from South accent. Carolina. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was like, I was like, so how is it that you have thousands of kids in the district and you have 30 PTs? Yeah. OT? Like, that's it? They should be, like, stressed out about to run out of school. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how that's working. So that was one thing we talked about, robust special ed training and support for all school staff, because we also have had paras now, the one-on-ones, they've they've combined um, positions, but haven't paid nobody any more money. Yep. So that's happening too. And then- Let me me, me just- I just wanted to add about demand number three because I know you're about to kill. I know you're about to kill demand number four. So <laughs> before 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 tomorrow kills demand number four, I just wanted to uh, just wanted to say for for demand number three in terms of our teachers, um, our special education teachers, they also need to be more supported. Oftentimes, I find the teachers in the, who are the special education teachers are the first ones to get pulled if a teacher is absent to cover a class. So if those are the teachers who are constantly being pulled. How in the world are the children that they are supposed to service getting their services? This is an issue that is rampant in the school district of Philadelphia. And it's because, I mean, there are a whole lot of reasons, a whole lot of reasons why. But the but but the end result is that children aren't getting their their services. So the special education teachers definitely need need more support. They need more resources and they need to not be seen in the special education teachers as well as the pairs as being expendable. Like, okay, something goes wrong, let's pull them first. No, we're not doing that. Like there needs to be a better system in place so all children get the benefit of learning. We also wanna make sure that our children who are identified as special education if they get the tools that they need in order to not be identified, they don't have to have that identification for all 12 years. But if they do, then the parents also need to be given resources of how to continue their education once they leave the school district of Philadelphia. So, Right, because let me tell right. you, you mm-hmm. need to make sure that you maintain their IEP to college because I know that when I teach in higher ed, I get letters all the time from disability officers. For my mm-hmm. students that need more time, da da da. Because I've had, I when I had, when I used to work on the dark side, this one charter school that I will not name because it's Girl. so <laughs> it's so illegal and it's still open. I'm always like, so <laughs> oh so lord. So we gonna have a whole different conversation about <laughs> right. something like that. I think so. One we, thing we that used to happen, I mean, yeah, I went out an IP meeting and the CEO was encouraging because I had updates for the students' IEP, right? Yep. I was like, they can do these more. They can. I was like, for one, I was like, when was the last time this was updated? Like when Jesus died? Like what is going on? This update. I said because he's doing like more stuff in my classroom, right? Mm-hmm. So, a little dusty. Right. I was like, so they you know updated the stuff after they you know whatever. And then the CEO was like, oh well, if he's like writing an entire essay with a thesis statement, then we should remove his his IEP. I said like, he's still dyslexic. Right. Right. Like he still has a reading disorder. Right. I said, so that should follow him through college if he wants to go to college, right? Like 
I have worked, you know, with him because I can, but this is, you know, what you can do. So that, yeah, and we also need to stop outsourcing. Okay, I'm saying that again. We need to stop Girl. outsourcing the services to people that aren't even specially certified. Like a lot of the organizations and companies that the school district outsources, only because I used to work for some of them. Like I've worked on the dark side a lot. So that's why they really don't like it when I come to talk. Wow. No, I, mean, I mean, I look at this. I mean, I grew up. I grew up. My 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 sister's a special needs kid. My mom taught in special like special education for a while. She yeah. worked. She worked like this, and I, you can see this firsthand. And you know, it's it's sim- it's very simply. It's a question of power, right? These these are folks. It really is. These yeah. are folks who do not have the kind of like the 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 organizing strength and the power, like as a constituency. The fight, which uh-huh. which means that we all we just like you said, like this is why it's got to be all kids because that's exactly what they do. Say, so, well, look, you know the. There's, you know, the, the special needs kids like, well, you know what, you know, maybe if uh, we just pull that teacher, no one's going to really kind of chime up about it because, you know, the, the well to do parents who are in there, you know, their kids are going to be taken care of. Right. I mean, right. And, that, and that's how that that ends up working up. But let me let me just jump in for one second right now. So we know we had some people that have jumped on and um, we will have some um, time, probably about 10 minutes or so. We'll kind of open up if folks, if anybody does want to mm-hmm. call into the studio and want to add any comments or questions on this. Um, we also want to kind of remind you, this is a. Uh, um, my name is Kevin Mahoney, and this is Out to Coop Live. This is part of our kind of podcast series for Raging Chicken. Um, and if you want to kind of support this show, right, keep it going, keep it going strong, um, you can do so for as little as five bucks a month by going to patreon.com slash RC Press. Or you can go to down right at the bottom of that little app you got there and send us a little gift, cup of coffee, gold mic, whatever it might be. You can buy golden beans from Podbean to help us uh, support the show. Um, and again, I'm talking here with Tamara Anderson and Dana Carter from the Racial Justice Organization organizing committee in philadelphia so i didn't want to kind of uh jump in disrupt too much there but i uh, want to make sure the folks who kind of jumped in the podcast uh, part way through knew uh kind of where we are and what we're talking about mm-hmm. um, some station uh, identification there you right. go <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things, one of the things that we see in, in kind of in all in all of these, uh, and I want to get to that number four because I know because I because uh, you know Dana, you already kind of like uh, uh, set tomorrow up on this one and say okay, she's ready right. to roll on this. But one of the things that I want to kind of point to just to make sure that because because if we don't get a chance to get through all through all of them by the time people want to kind of call in, is that one mm-hmm. of the things that I love about what's going on here is that it's pushing the horizon and saying mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. what not what do we think is doable under existing kind of like ways of thinking but what is it that we want what does it look like to establish a school right to see the school as as a kind of a a locus of change and it's almost like flipping this scenario on its head like you know because we always hear we all we all know you know as well as i do you've been involved with education as long as you do you know that schools everyone expects schools to do everything right everyone yeah. expects schools to solve all the social problems right and we really know mm-hmm. that the number one indicator right of kind of how somebody is going to do in life and how they're going to kind of do in school has to do with their zip code and has to to do with their um you know socioeconomic status mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and you add that into kind of a system of kind of racial injustice right a racial oppression right that basically kind of like just doubles down on that very structure right so so they you know say well look if we want to solve those problems we got to do that kind of outside the school but what this does what these 10 demands do and said okay you say you want to say that schools are the going to be the ones that we're going to we're going to solve this okay we'll take that charge this is what we need then <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. This is yeah. what the school should be if it's going to be the engine of change. So, so let me put put over to you again tomorrow now, and kind of we're just about to talk about. You know, we talk about specific programs here, and now we're starting to kind of widen out a little bit to kind of see here's that horizon, right? This is what mm-hmm. this needs to be in the schools. Yeah, yeah, like four, five, six, and seven. I'm gonna smash them together. There you go. <laughs> which is because they are literally what you just said, just perfect. Like it is basically like if you want us to, if you're saying that we are supposedly spinning plates on one leg, right? Yep. So this is what we need to make the magic happen. This is what we really need to break not only the pipeline to prison, but to really um, transform the pipeline to poverty and the cycle, right? So. We demand that trans, queer, and gender non-conforming students and staff, oh my gosh, like I said, it's a hundred times. So they gave yep. this wonderful policy, policy number 252, um, which was about uh, protecting from discrimination, 
for gender non-conforming students, trans and queer students, and for faculty. And then they gave these trainings to the teachers. And I'm just gonna let that marinate in silence <laughs> because it was kind of like a funeral. You know what I'm saying? Like uh -huh. I, I attended like, the training. She's not I was crazy. like, who did this terrible thing? <laughs> right? Like it was really bad. And and it's funny because in the newspaper, you no know, Al Jazeera, Mother Jones, they were like, Philly has this robust, you know, trans queer policy. And I was like, and then they train people. <laughs> that should be like the cut 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 at the end, right? Was it what, was, so, was it like one of these things where you go like, uh, okay, uh, next PowerPoint slide, please? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and no. And some of it has to do that it doesn't have. It has like I remember the big blowout in students with their names in Google Classroom, right? Mm -hmm. And I saw some of the teachers and parents, you know, the, I, some of that homophobia definitely like whoop, spilled over into social media. And I was like, so this is still an issue, right? Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something to talk about. And we have tons of partners, the Attic, Mazzoni Center. Um, I think I think I just lost somebody. Oh, there we go. I think I lost oh, you sorry. tomorrow. Nope, gotcha. You, you hear me? Okay. Yep, yep. I'm sorry. Um, and so then we also demand equitable hiring practices. Um, and not just, we do want to hire and retain black teachers. Let me just say that. We also want to make sure that parents are not getting paid fourteen five a year. Let me just say that for the chief yeah. seats. Like, they, they work a lot of hours, work a lot of time. For, but because of fourteen five, though, they also have to work other jobs. To, to even stay afloat. And then on top of this, we also need to make sure that we need to have mandated anti-racist training because in order for you to diversify your hiring practices, you have to diversify and decolonize your lens, right? Mm -hmm. Because I have lots of principals who will tell me, well, it doesn't matter what the teacher is, as long as they're the best teacher. And I said, well, that's funny because the best teacher to you is always a white one. <laughs> <laughs> like that's funny how that works. That's funny. Right. Like, like I have referred <laughs> even to my daughter's former school. I have referred black teachers to the principal. I know he. I know he was like, when did she graduate? Okay. <laughs> I was like, here are ten people that are amazing. They should come and work for you, right? And then we also demand culturally responsive curriculum. It doesn't matter though if we demand this. Number seven is the linchpin for all of this stuff. If you don't have an anti-racist lens, if you don't have a, a mind and a lens of how to decolonize the curriculum and the school, you will continue to limp along and do the same thing. It's just like there was this, um, you, this TED talk that Melody Hobbs had gave eons ago about being racially brave to talk about race, right? And she was saying about this whole story of ESPN this quintessential Southern white guy was president at the time, and he wanted to diversify ESPN. And so people came to him and said, so you want us to hire like the best black person or just the best person? And he said yes to both. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, And as a result, that whole cycle he was president, ESPN end up diversifying their workforce by like 50%. Mm -hmm. So it takes like a laser light focus for you to do it, right? Yep. And then of course that goes into non-toxic schools and asbestos. Yeah, we don't, we would like to breathe. You know what I'm saying? Some well, you know, it's funny. Yeah, th this stuff right here. This is the kind of stuff. This is this one is. When I saw this one too, as well, I said, "Man, I thought this is why." I, I mean, again, this is not why per se, but it's like the fact that you're including the actual physical structures of the buildings themselves is so absolutely critical. I mean, I think everybody out there needs to know things like this. Is like you know, there was like this huge increase in like, well, huge, okay, huge increase in crime, right, in the in the uh -huh. late '60s and '70s, right, and then mm -hmm. then it was like, oh, it's a Crime. That, you know, that's still the legacy we're living under. That kind of the political fear that was kind of like, you know, about the, the crime wave that's coming. That's old, you know, sorry, sorry, all you liberals out there, but that's Joe Biden's <laughs> super predator right there, right? I mean, right. This, this is the, that whole that whole time, right? And then they found, mm -hmm. and, and, and there, it was funny because there was an increase of this that was happening, not just in the United States, but other places around the world. And then they found out that, holy crap, the lead in the paint 
right, mm -hmm. is causing all sorts of brain disorders, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. that is expressing themselves in this violent behavior and criminal activity or just being dropped out of society, right? And then they find out that, oh, my God, the crime wave goes down. Well, how did it go down? Well, they took the lead out of gasoline and they took the lead out of paint. Right. Mm -hmm. And those communities right. that were hit the hardest were communities of color, poor mm -hmm. communities of color were hit the hardest. Rural, poor communities were hit also. Uh -huh. Right. And then so so you see this kind of stuff. So we're talking about when we're talking about the buildings that are free of pests and lead and asbestos. Right. It's not just mm -hmm. the kind of like, oh, we want pretty buildings. No, this goes to the core of what we're talking about. Say you know, talk about environmental justice. <laughs> right. Right. Um, right. In our backyards. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but that cellular, was that was no, yeah. no, that's right because mm -hmm. you don't want cellular trauma. That's exactly. what you're talking about. But nobody talks about that. It's just like when we talk about Flint, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, even when I've written 40 blogs about it, that they I'm like, you do realize the issue is not that Michigan has poor water sources. It's surrounded by a great lake. Two of them, in fact. Yep. And they have fresh water. It's just the governor at the time switched the water to the, the river, which basically was a chemical dumping site forever. Bingo. So now you have generations of people dying of Legionnaire's disease. You have generations of people that have lead so high that on a cellular level, they're going to pass it down to their children because that's exactly what lead does. And then we don't talk about the fact that being in pest field places, people actually develop. I have teachers I used to work with in New York because New York, you know, has like used to have these high rises and all these crazy things. And I have a teachers who are in their forties and fifties who literally had allergies to pest dropping. Yep. yep. Because I was like, is that a thing? She was like, Oh, yeah. Like if you're from here, like I went to school in New York public schools and developed an allergy to rodent dropping. I said, God no. <laughs> and these were mostly like older teachers of color, yep. right? So this is like a generational thing. And if we really want to stop it and move forward in some sort of fidelity and integrity, we can't just like, you know, say, oh, we're going to make sure your schools are pretty and we'll give you an anti-racist training that will throw up a video and good luck, blink, blink, and hope everything's better, <laughs> right? We basically, because even as a supervisor for student teachers, you know, I've had, I feel like I am an intervention when I see them their last year of college. Yeah. You know, I'm like, well, let me just put some magic sauce on top of you before I send you out to go teach children. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. Because we also have to talk about, like, the pipeline. Like, what are we, like, as things become more corporate, there's also this, this need because of the middle states and all this stuff, in which I know you know about as a professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it, it becomes, it waters down your curriculum if you're not careful. And it forces people not to challenge and question like what is happening right like or the history or the fact that where has this happened before like you just talked about student movements and student walkouts like they go all the way back to 1960 yep. right until today and so the fact that every 20 years every 30 years every 10 years we have another series of uprisings another series of people fighting against the norm means that we never make enough change to actually get us to the other side. Yep. You know, there's always well, that's something because there. the people, the people in, you have to understand, just like how Tamara started yeah. off before, the educational system really wasn't meant to for everybody to succeed. So as long as the people who are in power continue to mm -hmm. be in power, there is no motivation for them to change the current situation. We have to make mm -hmm. that we have to make them motivated to change because yeah. people with old money aren't willing to, I mean, what is the motivation for them to, to do any type of racial or social justice work unless their children or their grandchildren convince them that it's important, right? So we need yeah. the white people with good sense to start speaking to their cousins and their fathers and their mothers and their brothers um, so so they can come into this work with, with, with mm -hmm. a genuine concern for the people and the students um, just to your point about the, the asbestos in schools, there was a class action lawsuit in 1986, right here in Pennsylvania, um, where the uh, manufacturers of asbestos were, were sued and the case got settled. If we knew all the way back then, I mean, I remember when I was in the fifth grade, the eighth grade students walked out in Levering, and I think that was 86. Franklin Learning Center kids walked out in 91. 
why are we still talking about the same things? And it's just basically because the people don't care. You can't tell me that you care and it's 30 years later and we're still talking about the same issues. They don't care, so we have to make them care. And I think it's ridiculous that teachers are getting sick, students are getting sick because of toxic schools in the year 2020. So we could talk about that all day. Our our last our last demand is um for the school board of Philadelphia to accept our Black Lives Matter uh, week at schools curriculum, which is something that we've been asking for, for forever. In addition to that, we really want them to act like Black Lives Matter in the school district of Philadelphia and to remove any school board member with a history of racial bias. I'm just going to say on a personal level, I don't know how you can make policies that benefit children of color if you are a Trump supporter. I don't exactly. understand how I mean, you could I, teach children it yeah. teach children with with a genuine heart and genuine concern if you are a follower of Donald Trump and his policies. But uh, just on the school board level, those people who are in charge of making the policies that 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 affect our children's lives, I think we have to you know be a little bit more um, investigatory about um, their their own beliefs and how they behave in their personal lives towards children of color. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, look at this. They need to be taken down just like the Rizzo statue, right? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, bring them down yeah. just like that. Because the, that that I, I couldn't agree more is that, and this is where it's not, well, two things, I'm you know, and again, if there's anybody out there that's got a, a burning issue, what you kind of want to call, you got a comment, you got some question, uh, feel free to kind of call in the show anytime. You should be have a little uh, button at the bottom of your uh, bottom of your app that says kind of call in we can take your call you got a comment you got something to add you got a question we'd be more than happy to take um take your calls for the next i'll say 10 15 minutes or so before we wrap up the show but one of the things that um um now of course i lost my train of thought right oh no no the, the, the whole idea is that well two things like one you know it does become from my perspective at least i'll speak only for myself here so that my that it becomes a question that you know it is about kind of individuals right so it's right. not just mm-hmm. like some sort of abstract system that's out there. There's actually real people making real decisions and real choices, right? And that we have to kind of basically hold those folks accountable. And then this goes back Absolutely. to the other, yeah. And then this goes to the the other point that you're making, right? The whole idea that you know, look, why are we still fighting these battles, right? And I think that you know the lesson that I think I look at like Gen Z folks now, and I'm like. Fuck yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Just, it's about yeah. time. You know, it's like, yeah. I was like, you need bail money? I got you. Right? I mean, it's That's like, right. you know, whatever. It's like it's over. Like, because I'm looking at that and I'm saying, because I think they they understand, right? That right. if we just kind of say, hey, look, things are getting better and it's automatically going to magically progress, that things are going to get better. Say, so, no, no, no. It's going to return to the default system, right? Definitely which is, which has yep. been here since the founding of this country. Right. 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 So, I, you know, so, so I'm looking at that. I'm saying, you know, like, you know, the kind of message that you'd have for folks. I mean, I mean, obviously, I mean, you're on the ground fighting the fight in Philadelphia. Right. But you've got folks, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, can use a little kind of bolstering up about, you know, why is it so important to go big? Right. Why is it so important to go hard and not just trust that things will get better if we're just say like, got a good relationship with management, for example. <laughs> right. I mean, you right. Just look at the, you got to look at the history um, of, of, of our country. You know, things have not gotten better um, unless there was a drastic change. And one thing I can say, and I know a lot of people look at me like I'm crazy. I'm not a Trump supporter, but what I will say is that the election of Donald Trump has, has sparked a sense of unity um, among people, advocates, activists, and I've never seen this in my life. I'm 42 years yeah. old. So mm-hmm. that's, that is one benefit. If there's any benefit from his presidency, it is that I don't believe we have ever been more focused than we are at this point right now. So we don't want to lose that. We can't lose that momentum. Um, and we need to take it to the next level. Aside from that, what 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 good is it to, 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 grab, to grab at sand when it's boulders right in front of you that you can lift with no problem. Like, what are you doing? What are you right. doing? Why are you right. looking for the smallest thing to do in order to make a difference? And I understand that everybody is not capable of doing everything, but in terms of education, and, and this is why, you know, I'm a little testy when it comes to certain educators, you're, you have children in front of you. 
So I don't understand how you don't speak up because at the end of the day, if you're quiet, then you harm a child. Yeah. So you have to speak up for the greater good because you're a teacher. And if you're not cut out for that, then perhaps you need a different profession. All due respect. But this is what we require today. We require teachers who know how to advocate for their kids. And if they don't know how to advocate, if they don't know how to be activists, then they need to reach out to someone who can advocate for them. You can go right. ahead, Here, here. <laughs> No, that was you just said everything. I mean, I also I also would like to say too. Oh, I this is what I used to say all the time during the crack epidemic, right? Mm -hmm. So when the crack ep epidemic was happening, it was it was killing black communities and you know suburban and white communities, or people were moving to the suburbs, and, and it was all this idea of escape. And this, mm -hmm. and, and this idea, we're going to build up these like uh, these communities, these gated communities to keep stuff out. And then what happened? It came right to your community. Yep. Mm -hmm. right? um, I mean, when gun violence is in Chicago, it spills over into the suburbs. It spills over into hunting communities. It spills over into rural communities. So I say every day, how many lessons do you need to learn that if you wait, it will come knocking on your door? In That's the right, guise girl. of your dead child, in That's the guise right, of your overdose cousin, in the mm -hmm. guise of your dead uncle, in mm -hmm. the guise of your um lung, your toxic poison father, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to do that. But instead of you waiting for it to like actually hit your doorstep, maybe, oh, maybe you should actually look beyond yourself and say, hey, this is how, this is what I can do. Because all of us are capable of doing something, even if it's just a small hanging fruit. It's the small actions that lead to greater actions, right? And we can always join something. Like, that's always my thing when people sit and complain. Oh, I can't believe this such is happening. Da, 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 da. Something as small as what's happening with the sanitation workers here in Philly. Mm -hmm. Now, to some people, they could care less that as of last week, it's 125 that have tested positive for COVID. But I'm like, if you have a car and you have access and you got two neighbors, go do a drive to the sanitation center. Mm -hmm. They're so nice. It's so easy. Yep. And when I tell you they smile from ear to ear every time, like I go once a week, <laughs> they're like, uh, this helps because the right. news, the media is not telling our story. Exactly. And mm -hmm. people think that we are being lazy or I have people mm -hmm. post on my Facebook page, well, what are they doing to take care of themselves? How dare you? Mm -hmm. They are providing a service that you definitely don't want to provide. <laughs> exactly. Sitting right. on the back of a truck with trash and maybe some pee pee, some, some, some mass that maybe. may last that may not. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Not to mention they've been shorted over time because the excess of trash they've had due to the pandemic. But all of that, to me- No access is, to fresh water. Right, is you being connected to what's on the ground. Like, mm -hmm. I, it's like a burning in my system when people sit and they like they decide I'm the person they should call to complain, which I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. Because I'm just like, uh, no. Like, who have you connected with? Who have you talked to? Even if it's just going to a meeting, even if it's just making a phone call, even if it's just making sure that mutual aid is supported and people can get yeah. groceries to people. You don't have to always physically be in the space, but you yeah. definitely have to stop thinking of things for just yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's it. You know what? I've got this, you know, I've perennially, I got this, I get this article that I want to write that's in the back of my head. Like how many people, how many, I'm just want to, you know, <laughs> got this going on. Right. But it's, wow. a, and I just get the title of it in my head is kind of like you've been schooled. Right. And, yes. and what I mean about that is like, and you know, I mean, I grew look, I mean, I grew up like for our start of my life was like a single parent family with a, you know, my sister, my sister, we have, a, we have an allergy to the MMR, like to the MMR vaccine. My sister got brain damage because of the result of that and medical malpractice mm. and a whole bunch of other stuff that thrust us into poverty. Right. My mom couldn't work and take care of my sister. Right. We grew up on food stamps. I still freaking can't stand even the thought of powdered milk. It makes my stomach turn. Wow. Right. Yeah. About what that meant. But, but, you know, and, and, and I look to think Things like, you know, both, you know, the, you know, grew up Catholic, I'm Irish Catholic, I <laughs> grew up Catholic. So I mm -hmm. looked both to the church, right, and to school as places that kind of gave me some sort of light out, right? Mm -hmm. And 
and when I, in particular school, because the church pretty quickly that they they, they they sold me down the river. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. you guys don't practice what you preach. That was pretty quick. I could see that. Mm-hmm. But when mm-hmm. I came to school, right, I bought in hard to that whole ideology, right, that this is the place that that you can you can strive and you can thrive, and 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 I'm not saying that's not true. But the thing was, is that, you know, growing up in the 80s, right, growing up in the, in the 70s and 80s, born in 1969, uh-huh. growing up in that time, it was a, all about the separation, that education was going to separate you from your sure community. Was. And yeah. it gave you that idea that you need to look down upon people that are working uh-huh. at the gas station. You need to look down. You don't, you know, you take your kid and you, I'd see my neighbors do this and look and take them out when the garbage collectors were coming. Sanitation workers are coming like, you don't want to end up like them. Right. right. That was right. that that pernicious ideology mm-hmm. that was kind of like, and it felt, you know, as it felt the flip side of it, like, oh, there's hope here. I don't have to be like this. Like, I don't have to stick in this situation. I can crawl my way out. But that's the that is the that is the the devil's work, if you ask me, <laughs> because yeah. that is about yeah. disconnecting us from the the very people that we should be most connected to in our communities. And so, so, I mean, that example is so great to hear because, I mean, that is one of those things that, you know, I try to stress with my own students. And I think that is really at the core of what we see happening and what we see happening in these movements now about people making those connections and say, you know what? We've been we've been looking up to the wrong people (laughs) for a long time. Which is basically the argument that Du Bois and Ida B. Wells had all the time. Yeah. You know, Ida B. Wells always would write letters to him. And he was like, if we just educate people, then lynchings would go down. He's yeah. like, they'll lynch you too. Yeah. Like, that's not what that is. And they'll read like, poetry he, while they do it, right? Right. Like, <laughs> she was like, you need to, like, stop. You need to get off that pedestal and start really looking. I mean, it's the same. Like, my mom was one of the youngest presidents of her union local of IEA when I was growing up. So I spent a lot of my time being dragged from meeting to meeting with my Etch-A-Sketch and hopes and dreams. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I think, like, even being Catholic and being Chicago and Catholic, where it's, like, Black Catholics and Irish Catholics on two separate sides of the city, yep, right? Yep, And the fact that I went to an Irish Catholic high school that basically told me, as a person who's an altar server, well, you know, we don't do Black History Month here. How does that work <laughs> when Black History Month is celebrated at cathedral with the bishop? Mm-hmm. How, what does that happen at? Only mm-hmm. in this little circle of the world? So that, I, like, from a very early age, it's always been like, you were responsible for somebody else. You know, even as an only child, like, I, you know, I'm responsible for somebody next to me, period. Like, no questions asked. And not because I want to wear a big badge or get some shiny bauble light and be in the press. I could care less about that being. Like, the whole point is that what, what can happen to make change happen in people's lives, even if it's just a connection to services, a mm-hmm. connection to knowing that this can help you or knowing that when we were sold a, a bad bill of goods by Comcast five years ago, when we had an opportunity to actually have them pay taxes, we said, when they told us, we'll give people free internet, blah, 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 blah. we didn't listen to the fact that the internet was such a low speed that that's enough to basically turn on your cell phone and maybe turn around the circle. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Like, that's it. Like, With your know, GPS. Yeah. Right. That's all. You're like, I can't even watch Hulu because it just keeps freezing. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't even watch your free necklace that you stole from your sister because nobody can watch it because it's 25 MPS. But we didn't ask them questions. Yeah, but I guarantee, I guarantee the one thing that will come up is the advertisement for cyber charters. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. It's right. built into the hardware. Not right. sure. It like comes up every five minutes. You're like, how is this a thing that that's an ad when I can't even get the internet? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But okay. Yeah, so no, I don't know. I think it's like, and I think that's what's even coming to light with the youth now, right? With PSU, Youth for Black Lives, like all these youth organizations that are asking and demanding to be seen and to be heard, right? Is the fact that we can no longer sit back and pretend like, oh, it's just a few bad apples, or it's just a few this, or the rubber room is where we send them when it happens. Yeah, but you don't say anything when they come back. I have heard students in the hallway be like, Girl. oh, here he comes. Like, he gonna call somebody the N-word before he leaves today. What? 
Yep. <laughs> like, is that a thing? You know, I was like, right. And know, that's acceptable. I, and I'm just like, and then of course, I think as a parent, like I've had to advocate for parents who were scared to go talk to the principal because they were mm-hmm. like, you know, he's going to do something, you know, to my kid in the special ed program. And I said, what's your kid's name? Okay, come on, we'll go talk to him together. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, I know he don't want to ever see my face up in there. But <laughs> if I have to use a little privilege I have for good, then that's what I'm going to do. Like, you also should not have to, to fight these battles alone either. Mm-hmm. Too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is this has been awesome. So before we kind of wind up for the show, if anybody does have the quick comments, if they want to jump in, please feel free. Um, but like that kind of close, uh, like close out a little bit. Well, first, let me say, like, this has been awesome. Like, I feel, you know, I, I don't know if you all get this feeling, too, as well, but both are kind of feeling like I feel charged up. Right. And angry yeah. and sad yeah. all at the same time. You know, <laughs> right. it's, like, it's like that. You feel like a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's, like, it's kind of where we're at. Right. But it's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, you know, and I, uh, you know, like to kind of, you know, give you opportunity to say, you know, kind of close out. What are some things you want to leave people with and anything else you want to plug specifically that you're working on? I and mean, you kind of mentioned at the top of the show a little bit about what you got coming up here, um, coming up in the fall. Definitely want to kind of hear some plugs in that. Um, and um, and also definitely kind of, as this kind of moves on, uh, man, I hope I can have you back on the show because I'd love to kind of kind of, kind of stay up to date with what's going on, kind of where, where we are, the struggle and how we can kind of amplify um, the work that y'all doing because it's just it's freaking great stuff. Um, I, OK, I can start and then some tomorrow can close. Um, we have an open meeting for the mm-hmm. Racial Justice Organizing Committee tomorrow at four o'clock. You can check our Facebook page or Instagram page or Tamara and I's um, personal Facebook page for information on how to sign up. Uh, it's four o'clock tomorrow. Um, we still want people to uplift our demands, our racial justice to demands for radical education transformation. You can find that on the Racial Justice Organizing Committee website. Um, I'm doing a effort to rename Philadelphia streets in schools. This is also that, another yeah. race. Yeah, racial justice organizing effort. Um, so far, we have four schools identified: Woodrow Wilson, Benjamin Franklin, um, and that is a tribute to the class of 1970 because they wanted that change to Malcolm X High. Mm-hmm. Um, Ed B. Anderson, that is the principal's request, and Samuel Gompers. So please support that effort. Um, you can find more information on the Racial Justice Committee's website. Yeah, we got links right down in the show notes that uh, you can click right on there. It'll take you there. You can explore the page. And I, I, I definitely like I, I think that uh, everyone should also check out. We didn't get a chance to talk about this, but the educators responding to National Uprising resource guide that you all have on the site is freaking amazing. Yeah. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that you got it broken down from like, you know, kindergarten right up through kind of secondary. I mean, it's just 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 freaking fantastic. So uh, so so tomorrow, let's close out with you. Uh, we also have the Philly Youth Freedom Dreaming event that we are doing with Poppin', and um, it's happening August 26th, and that mm-hmm. information is also on the Racial Justice Organizing Facebook page. There's a sign in, there's RSVP. It's like bit.ly uh, forward slash, and it's Freedom Dreams, but P-H is the uh, P-H-R-E-E-D-O-M um, mm-hmm. for that. And then um, you can also sign up on the web page to if you want to get like information or be on our listserv we have like a google group where information goes out all the time if you're like an email person or if you're like a facebook person which i know for young people like my space right now you can basically <laughs> go on there <laughs> you can also go on instagram because we also post our flyers and stuff there um and also of course you know please check out the national black lives matter um at school um, web page uh, black mm-hmm. at www.blacklivesmatter at school.com um, and bar we too yes because bar we has a, um, yeah. there's a link on our page but there's also um, a link to the black lives matter curriculum and there's also a link to the year of purpose and there's also a link to black lives matter and get the youth vote out because we also are mm-hmm. uh, like we're supporting um, getting all these 18 year olds registered to vote by October for the November election and letting people know that even if you have a felony record, if you are homeless, you can still register to vote, actually. So, yes. 
Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I'll put as many of those links that I can squeeze into our show notes down there. To absolutely. Because this, uh, I mean, at the very least, you know, get get on over to the uh, Racial Justice Organizing Committee website. There's links to lots of this stuff. We have a bunch of this stuff embedded in, uh, in the show, um, kind of without a doubt. And, you know, and next week, uh, um, just so for everybody knows, for, for next week uh, is the, the back to school at Kutztown University, the university in which I, I work. And, of course, they uh-huh. are going back face to face because grit and fortitude will save you from the virus. <laughs> Virus, right. Um, wow. That, that's apparently wow. what uh, President Kenneth Hawkinson will do. So uh, hopefully, since it's the start of ca- uh, classes next week, that we'll get someone from the uh, Healthy Campus Bill of Rights uh, student, that oh. one of the student organizers from that at Kutztown. Oh, wow. And also, an, uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to get her on. She's a, a student organizer. There's a bunch of students, but one student in particular um, that working as a, um, a solidarity campaign at East Stroudsburg University with food service workers, which is freaking awesome oh, nice. stuff. Wow. Oh, how yeah. nice. Yeah, uh, some good stuff going on. I'll tell you, there's some good organizing going on everywhere that you look. And, uh, you know, I only wish I could do this full time. <laughs> That's all I yeah. got to say. Um, so, uh, yeah. So once again, I want to I want to thank Tamara Anderson uh, and Dana and Dana Carter. Please thank you so much for joining me tonight uh, for Out the Coop Live. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, thank this you. Thank you. Fun. Oh, this is a blast. Was, I got all made up for nothing. <laughs> this was we have to get you out. We, we, we have to get uh, got to get some more members. We'll get the video feed going. Well, next time we get to, you'll be all set. <laughs> Bro, I was like, I was like, thank you for no video. I was like, Ooh. oh yes. man, that's great. Well, and thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, and you know, you could do something really simple to help kind of promote the show is just to kind of share this with your friends. You can share the link to our podcast. You can share it for this particular show. You just go to the Podbean app. You go to iTunes, wherever you get your podcast. Um, you can see this. This will also be posted to our Facebook page at Raging Chicken. Um, this will be also on our YouTube page so save this link it link to it and share it with your friends all over social media um and kind of get the word out here and help kind of amplify the amazing work that is going on in kind of like activist communities all across this state and across this country so you, once again you can support this show by becoming a patron for as little as five bucks a month just go to patreon.com slash rc press um you could show us some love during the live show right next week right but give us a little gift at the bottom of the show so next week uh we hope to see you back here at raging chicken we'll also be back on friday for our regular out to coop podcast with sean kitchen this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Um, we're out for this evening. Going to leave you once again with some Jonathan Mann. Other people of the future? Damn straight there are. See ya! Oh.